Welcome to the Patchwork Podcast. My name is Brandon Robertson. Patchwork is a show that brings together various voices and perspectives on topics relating to spirituality, social justice, and culture to help you expand your mind and tap into a richer, fuller life. To start, let me introduce myself. I'm a pastor, an author, and a consultant to faith communities, governments, and organizations around the world about how we can build bridges of understanding and see the world from a perspective different than our own. This podcast is an extension of that passion and that work. In every episode, we'll dive deep into a topic with an expert in the field to see if we can gain a better understanding. You might agree with what's said, and you might disagree. But whatever the case, I invite you to lean in and listen deeply, because I assure you that you'll find something worth grabbing onto in every conversation that will enrich your journey. As with all things done in public, your support means the world to me. So if you find today's content compelling, please tweet, post, like, and share on all the social media platforms using the hashtag Patchwork. And your feedback really does help make this podcast better every episode. So if you have time, please consider heading on over to iTunes and leaving a review. Again, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's jump into today's conversation. I hope you found today's content compelling and inspiring. It's through listening in and learning from others who see the world differently than we do, which by the way means everyone because no two people share the same vantage point. That's how we grow and expand. If you did enjoy today's podcast, please share it with your friends on social media and help spread the word. And when you do, use the hashtag Patchwork. If you'd like to support this podcast financially, head on over to patreon.com and search for Brandon Robertson. There you can become a monthly subscriber to this podcast. No gift is too big or too small, and you'll get tons of bonus materials that we produce just for our Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much in advance. Thank you again for spending some time with us today. Until next time, peace be with you. What on earth are you here for? That's the question we're going to think about today on the Patrick Podcast. Thanks for tuning in again. It's Brandon here. And today we're going to talk about two interesting and different topics. The first of which is vocation. And the second of which is the role of progressive spiritual leadership in the public square. Today's guest is a friend named Paul Rauschenbusch, who's the vice president at Auburn Seminary. He's also the founder of the Religion Column at Huffington Post. He's also owned a record company and has been at Princeton and done a lot of work as an American Baptist minister, as an activist, and as an evangelist of sorts. Paul is the inheritor of the great lineage of Walter Rauschenbusch, the founder of The Social Gospel. And Paul's life has really been to help spread the word about just and generous forms of religion, both in the media, in faith communities, in seminaries, in all sorts of ways. When I sat down with Paul in New York last week, we started off the conversation on this topic of vocation. Vocation is just a religious word for the calling, the purpose, what your life is meant for, what you're gifted and skilled to do in the world, how you're going to contribute to the world with your time here. Paul's life has taken many different turns in how his vocation is expressed. And so I knew no one better than to ask about this topic of vocation than Paul. In my own life, I've had this sense that I've been called to be a teacher, a pastor since I was 12 years old. But as my life has progressed, I've realized that this calling towards pastoral ministry isn't limited to the institution of the church, that it has a broader scope and scale and that it can manifest in many different sectors of society and culture. The calling, the gift, is far bigger than a singular job. 
No, vocation has to do with a set of skills, a set of gifts that give us life that we can contribute in every arena of our lives. And so today I chat with Paul a bit about how his own vocation has been lived out and ask him for some wisdom and advice for all of us on how we can live out our vocation, our calling, our gifts in the world. We then turn and talk a bit about the upcoming election, the current state of our country and our world, and how progressive people of faith can step up and use this moment to make an impact for the common good. There is no one better to talk to about these topics than Paul, and I really walked away from this conversation feeling encouraged, inspired, and full, ready to lean into my own vocation more, and as a progressive person of faith, to use my voice and my influence to help speak in the public square for the common good. And I think you'll find that same compelling sense of calling after you hear our conversation today. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Paul Rauschenbusch. Thanks again for making time to chat with me. You're a voice that I've wanted to talk to for a while because I've been so compelled by who you are in the world and the way that you've shown up in the world um, as an American Baptist minister, yeah, but also somebody who's been in the world of digital media and here at Auburn. So I think just the first question is, can you tell me how in the world did you end up where you're at today on this interesting journey of faith and vocation? Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I've also watched your um, public ministry and appreciated your voice throughout the years. Um, My sense is that a vocation is most conveniently looked at in a rearview mirror. I have often been surprised to find myself where I am, And it's not because I wasn't inspired to move to new positions and try new things. It's because I didn't know that that's what I was going to do when I started out. I really didn't have a clear sense, even when I went to seminary, that I was going to be interested in ordained ministry at all. Uh, I went to Union Theological Seminary in 1993. Um, because I was finding myself kind of captivated with this idea of um, the role of spirituality and my own life that had taken a path where I was open to inquiries that I hadn't been open to before. Um, I actually studied religion in college, but it was mostly so that I wouldn't have a job. Uh, I was pretty sure that there was no way I would use that major as a career. Um, But... After um, an, my own, um, you know, I had a record company for two years in Spain, um, and I had struggled with um, questions of addiction, you know, challenges of addiction. Um, and I kind of came to this place where I was attending church for the first time on my own, and I was attending a uh, um, a Baptist church, a Judson church in the village, which had a really strong social justice component to it. You know, so I was there. I started going there in 89. Um, and, you know, I would I would part of the extracurricular uh, activities of the church was doing um you know, needle cleaning kits because AIDS was devastating um, not only uh, the queer community, but also um, drug users. And so I saw a church that was combining a lot of what I was interested in. Also, it had a strong arts component. So um, so I went to seminary and um, someone said to me, you know, you should maybe uh, work in a church. Uh, as your field dad. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, I am the last person anyone wants in a church. But 
then it was like, well, when else am I going to have this opportunity? It's such a crazy idea. Like if someone's willing to have me come in there and, you know, be part of a discussion around God, community, Jesus, um, love, uh, then, then (laughs) go for it. And I found that, um, this, this church that I served, which was a Madison Avenue Baptist church, was really small. And there was kind of like one of everything. We called it a subway church. Mm-hmm. Like, one, like we, had, we had the Upper East Side matron, but then we had, um, we had you know, uh, drag queens who um, we had uh, people who didn't speak any English, this Japanese dance troupe. We had homeless people and they were, because it was so small, everyone was on like the boards. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, there was no like, uh, there was no elite, you know, group that was heading up all the committees. Everyone was doing everything. And of course it was completely crazy yeah. and it was nuts, but it was like, I was like, oh, I see. These are people who everywhere else in the city, they are completely on the outside. And here, the moment they walk in, they're completely on the inside. And that felt to me like a church and it felt like something that I could give my life to. And so, so through, you know, a, kind of a variety of um, being in certain places um, and always being curious about what's going on around me. So um, I think one of the the ways that I've um, moved has been (laughs) kind of embedded in this constant hustle and that has a negative connotations, but it's not really hustle to me kind of means, hey, who are you? What are you doing? I'm really interested in hearing about that. Um, Oh, wow. Maybe I have something to say about that. So, so, you know, even moving from, you know, from the various churches, working at Riverside Church, working at Princeton University and working at the Huffington Post. I mean, the Huffington Post happened because um, I wrote Ariana out of the blue and said, you're not doing religion. And I know how to do religion online. I had worked at BeliefNet for a while and had had an advice column and all of this. And so all of that was to say, like, I put myself in positions of saying, well, hey, maybe this can happen. Yeah. And most of the things don't happen. Yeah. And some of them do happen. And so then you arrive um, at uh, a, lo- a location where actually it's you realize, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I feel that way about Auburn now. Um, You know, I I had worked for six years at Huffington Post. I had accomplished what I expected, beyond my wildest dreams, actually. You know, we were for five years the largest religion website in the country. We went a Webby. We were, you know, we were, I had had amazing colleagues, um, both in my religion um, uh, team and then across the newsroom. We really, it was really amazing. And so, I told Ariana I was ready to move on and she said, well, stay until you find a job. And so I had the freedom to write an email to a lot of people and say, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I even said, like, maybe I should take a small church. Does any, you know, do, what do people think I should do? And, and one person, Catherine Henderson, who's the president of Auburn, wrote me right back and she said, I need to see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so here I'm actually involved in... Um, Again, I've, I've started a new platform called Auburn Voices, which is, you know, grounded in my work at BeliefNet and Huffington Post. But I'm also involved in keeping the lights on. So I'm asking people for money yeah. for the first time in my life, which I, I was always kind of the shiny object that other people paid for. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm completely not. Like, yeah. I'm actually, like, I'm much more behind the scenes. I'm much more... I'm actually really interested in what does it take to keep an institution running that's doing really great work in the world? How do we talk about that in ways that doesn't make it icky? Actually, we really need to get over the ickiness of money. Um, We really need to talk about how, how we need people to fuel the work that has to be done in this moment, this critical moment. We need people to step up financially. Um, and for some people that's very small amounts and that's great. And for other people, they have a lot more and I'm, you know, so, so it's just been, you know, this, this, I feel like everywhere I've gone, I've learned new things and, um, and been open to what this, you know, the spirit might be telling me. Yeah. The the last thing I'll say about this is we talk a lot about feeling called to some place. I think it's just as important to feel called away from a place. Mm. So I felt really called away from Princeton University, even though I had what many described as the most wonderful job in the world. And I, I knew that, like I knew that. And I knew that my heart was not the same as it was, you know, that last year it was not the same as it had been the first seven. Yeah. 
I felt the same way about the Huffington Post. So, so I just want to encourage people as they think about spirituality and vocation that, that it's okay to feel the rumblings yeah. that something new might be coming yeah. and pay attention to that. Yeah. There's so much in there that's so profound, I think, honestly. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me, one of the stories from the Bible that has always been really profound in my own life and vocation is Abraham stepping out in Genesis chapter 12 getting this random calling to go do something that he had no clue what it was, where he was going, but the call was to trust God, to trust that if you took the next right step that you'll end up where you're meant to be. And you really highlighted that in your own journey, in your own vocation. What would you say to people though that are, we're in a culture where safety and security is lacking in a sense of like job security and financial security. And there are a lot of people, I think, that feel unique callings, but are really afraid to step into them because they don't know if there's going to be a paycheck at the end of the day or if there's going to be security for their life and their family. Um, what would you say to those kind of people? I respect that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not like saying, hey, screw that, man. <laughs> Trust God. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I yeah. totally think that no, that's totally. silly, um, you know, because we have real concerns um, I just, I, I have two small kids now, like really small. And yeah. so like, you know, if I was just me, you know, I could maybe say, okay, well, you know, Hey, let's go backpacking, in, you know, you know, but, but I can't, you know, it, yeah. it's every, everyone has to weigh what's going on in their life. Yeah. I'm not saying do something. I'm saying be open. Yeah. Um, I'm saying, um, be um, be inquisitive about your life and what and 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 don't underestimate what you can do. Yeah. So that's different mm. than saying, you know, hey, quit your job today, man. <laughs> do it. Or, you yeah. know, tune in, drop out. Um, you know, the, I, I I think that that's unrealistic for the majority of the population. What's not unrealistic is to always be asking yourself, what 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 am I really feeling like I might want to do? Mm. And to start making some, um, you know, warming up your muscles to think about how I might do that. Yeah. And that can be as, as kind of, um, you know, the beginning steps can just be, be, uh, be curious about where you might want to go and learn about it. Yeah. And it never hurts to reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm really interested in what's going on over at this institute that you're running. Um, I'm not doing that right now, but, you know, I'd love to I'd love to have a conversation or or even just to, you know, look at what people are saying, get inspired. Um, I, I think that. It's not always your timing is not always the timing that will happen. Yeah. It's never been that way for me. Yeah. It's always been, you know, a couple years before I leave a place that I'm beginning to look around saying, what else might I do? Yeah. And so I, and I'm not saying I, I'm also really not saying if you're su if you are satisfied and your job allows you to continue to expand and grow and learn stay. Yeah. That's what we want. But I, 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 I think that um, I, I should also say like, there are certain ways in which, um, uh, you know, I feel actually a little more on the edge now, but there are certain ways and because I didn't have any um, dependence mm. and because um, I had a fairly substantial, not big, but enough that if I failed, I wouldn't be homeless. Yeah. You know, and so I just I don't want to like create a false picture that I, like that I'm not aware of you know what I was allowed to do, yeah. but but I do think this curiosity is open to everyone. I think yeah. the um, and um, I I I th actually think that's you know I, I've said before that curiosity is the ultimate spiritual value, and I do think that that is that is true in our, how we understand our vocation as well as how we understand uh, our relationship to Jesus to God to yeah. our. Uh, you know, whatever's going on in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I'm going to kind of go in a different direction, but it's based on something you said, you're doing this job now working in a progressive faith institution, raising money. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, I did a little political organizing in the last election um, and noticed that progressive people who are politically progressive tend to be skeptical of faith. Um, and one of the things that has been so frustrating for me as somebody who's gradually become more liberal over the years is standing in this space as a person of faith, but also standing in other progressive circles and trying to advocate for the 
the importance of religion, the importance of faith. And I hear you say that you do, did that at Huffington Post. You started the religion, uh, HuffPost religion, from the ground up. Why do you think, though, progressives are so skeptical of faith? And do you think that's changing in the course of your career? Have you seen that shift? I think that... I think progressives are skeptical of religion. I'm skeptical of religion. Yeah. I mean, a lot of terrible, terrible things are done in the name of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, that said, I also I, I also feel like um, there's a little bit of short a, a short memory mm. because for the last three decades, religion really has been um, kind of the almost the exclusive domain of the right yeah. um, that has been, you know, and, and because, you know, the right was very, you know, was very smart about how to use media. You know, you get, you get the Jerry Falwells, um, you get the Franklin Grahams, you get the, um, you know, a, a lot, all, all of these people saying outrageous things yeah. that reinforce a kind of, Religion is retrograde. Totally. But then, <clears throat> so I think that there's like a, um, it's not an amnesia, but there's like a, there's, there's a, an ignorance in some ways around the ways that religion has shown up in our, our, our country's history. Um, and, and I think that's really important for us to, to you know, not, not on, on, for those of us who are more progressive, we can't just say, oh, don't be mean to religion. We have to say, well, it's really important to remember yeah. that a lot of um, the New Deal happened um, because religious, because Christian churches influenced by the social gospel and other things were showing up for progressive um, economic policies, especially economic policies. Um, if you go back and look at the 1907, no, not to, yeah, 1907, I think it is, the Federal Council of Churches, when it first started, has a manifesto about social policies. Hmm. It makes anything we're saying today tepid. It's like, it, it's like AOC on steroids. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, you can't believe how, um, how radical this, the religious statements were. They gave cover for a lot of the social programs that we have come to um, know and expect. Social Security, all these things that happened under Roosevelt um, were, 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 were given um, a kind of moral mandate by the churches of the time. The civil rights movement is, is oft, uh, you know, often... Um, you know, the, the, we, we appreciate that because we know King, yeah. but it wasn't just King. Um, you know, there was a legislatures in the, in the, in, I can't remember exactly which one said it, but it was a, a pro segregation, you know, anti civil rights, um, legislator who said, who, who's, who, who recognized that the moment the churches came out full force in, in, in support of civil rights, they had lost. Yeah. And so, you know, so it's really important. And it's not just that around uh, around the arms race. There was, you know, there were the, around um, actually around a lot of um, interesting work has been done on queer, um, how the religion, sh uh, how early um, like Protestant ministers showed up for drag queens in the 60s in San Francisco, yeah. um, how P flag and many of the, the places were founded in church basements. There's some yeah. great work. I think it's Beth Stroud who's doing great work on like church basements and radical activity. Wow. So I just think it's important that we don't seed the history. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I also feel like what, you know, <laughs> that a lot of times, um, I feel like there's a wistfulness among the progressive secular, like they they almost want us Christians, I'll say, to be the people that they really thought we might be. Yeah, they're like there's a, a sense of like um, almost a sense of um, disappointment mm -hmm. when we don't show up 
like they think Jesus might show up, yeah. which is loving, which is just, which is kind, which is compassionate to the outsider. They have this idea. That's the reason, you know, for the first three years, I was at HuffPost when Pope Francis came. And all these people were like, oh, my God, finally, there's a Christian who's actually like representing all these were secular, you know, people who were like, oh, I love, you know, I love that someone's actually saying these things. Yeah. Um, and so so I think that there's a, there, there is really a sense like um, among the progressive left that when you show up um, as the, the way they actually deep down feel that Jesus should be showing up. Yeah. They're like super happy about it. Yeah. I don't think Reverend Barber has has tapped into this as a as a, an example who's you know beginning to move into the public consciousness. Like they're kind of like I heard this. You know, I've had friends of mine say I've heard of this. You know, this guy Reverend Barber. Have you heard of him? I'm like yeah yeah yeah, yeah I've heard of him. You know, but but you know but most but but he's not getting the headlines quite like yeah. still. Uh, you know, Franklin Graham, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., you know, these other people who right now um, have really put their t- all their cards on the table yeah. with Donald Trump. Yeah. And I think I, I think that uh, the American evangelicalism, especially, you know, the political wing of that is really going to regret it. Yeah. Um, because there's not a lot of there's not going to be a lot of people who will forget yeah. where they showed up in this moment yeah. and how they showed up. Totally. Uh, so. Long, yeah. long answer to no, a short question. It's good. Um, do you think, why do you think the American media, though, is still so compelled by people like Franklin Graham over William Barber? Like, Yeah, I, I think that they're, you know, I think that's slightly shifting. Um, I think that, um, I think that, you know, Franklin Graham and Jerry Fowler Jr. Actually, it's very, it's very much nepotism because the only reason that they matter is because their parents, their fathers mattered. Yeah. Um, and so, like, you know, they're they're <clears throat> they're easy stand-ins, um, and you know, <laughs> it's it is um, in some ways even if they don't agree with them, um, they they get clicks. I mean, yeah. we have to remember media is a is a business, and yeah. so like um, there's certain there's certain ways in that they they are <clears throat> attractive because you know they're they're likely to say something that will piss a lot of people off, and that tends to generate. Um, but but I I think that there there is a um, because the the American religious evangelical right um, is in such lockstep. That they feel like they can actually capture a, um, a perspective yeah. with um, one of those main male leaders. It's much harder to do that on the left. It, by definition, yeah. the progressive religious left is diffuse. It's, uh, it is um, it is non-hierarchical. Yeah. Um, it is, um, you know, it, it is... Uh, fracturous and contentious and cantankerous and um, and and you know and and you, many you know people are very quick to say you don't speak for me even if they agree with ninety five percent of what they're saying so um, so I think it's a little bit harder to say oh I'll, we'll get the left position on yeah. this and that's fair and I actually kind of love that because mm-hmm. that's people yeah. we actually don't have one thing we don't have one position and also like you can't just put William Barber up there and, and expect him to represent a Muslim voice a, a Jewish voice yeah. uh, you know Hindu voice or a, a Sikh voice or a Buddhist voice and what, what I'm what I'm interested in is how um, how this really diffuse media landscape because digital has changed everything as far as media yeah. um, it, how that's going to be ultimately uh, great for a rising um, tide of voices. And that was my big thought with Huffington Post. Yeah. And it's I'm still doing that with Auburn Voices here. And this podcast is an example of that. More people have control of production. Yeah. More people can, people have control of their own voices. Um, and they can put them out there. Anyone can create a Twitter yeah. handle. I mean, we, you know, that's another discussion of who owns the, who owns the social media uh, landscape. But, but we do have much more production capabilities. And so I'm interested in how that is all going to shake out yeah. over the next, um, you know, over the next few years, but also how it's going to show, show up in, in the next election. Yeah, totally. 
And I think you've, it seems to me that you've kind of, you're doing ministry in a very unique way. Um, I would say it sounds like all of the stuff that you've been doing over the past however long has been versions of figuring out how to take this um, progressive version of Christianity, which is in your family line, um, this beautiful social gospel, and figure out how to uplift voices, how to spread it, how to make it um, go beyond the traditional bounds of where the social gospel has gotten locked in, I think. And oftentimes, at least in the past decade, it felt like there wasn't a ton of progressive Christian influence in the country, at least from where I stood. But I feel like that's changing. And I wonder, while that's changing, while progressive, a more robust version of Christianity, for instance, is becoming more mainstream in the United States, religion continues to decline. Church attendance continues to decline. I wonder what you see the future of institutionalized progressive religion as, uh, and tied in with that, what does your own religion look like these days, the personal practice of it? I want to take a little exception with something you just said, yeah. um, which is like the, the absence of progressive Christian faith over the last 10 years. Yeah. Actually, I feel like um, in the Obama era, yeah. um, we, we saw a manifestation of what progressive Christianity would look like, Absolutely. which is someone who, you know, is, is actually someone who's showing up for church. He may not be like the most robust Christian on his knees every day, but like many of us, he's showing up. Yeah. Um, he's creating space for religion. Yeah. Um, Josh Dubois is a serious guy who is his religion guy, yeah. you know, um, and it's in it's it's a manifestation of religion that uh, of of Christianity, and I want to be specific when I say, talk about religion. I'm, I'm, in here, in this case, I'm talking about a Christianity that is, in some ways, intentionally trying to decenter itself mm. from the conversation, yeah. and rather take its place in a circle yeah. of faith of people who are trying to figure it out. Um, and and that also includes people who no longer find sustenance in traditional religious spaces, yeah. but who are very interested in the spiritual mandate to to love one another, to try to figure out what does it mean to be a just society. And so, in some ways, like Obama represents that to me. Um, and he, you know, no, he's not a savior figure. Yeah. A brief aside, for all the times that we were accused of lifting up Obama as a savior, it was, it's nothing compared to what the religious right is doing with Trump. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. I've said that, now I can move on. Um, so, so, you know, so I, I, I feel like in some ways we have to, we can no longer go back to, oh God, remember the good old days when you know, basically everyone was a Christian and we could, you know, they're nice Jews and nice, yeah. but everybody was a Christian and that was at the center of conversation and to, um, and to understand American religious life, we just needed to talk about Niebuhr. Um, you know, those days are gone and they're not coming back and it's fine. Everything evolves, yeah. you know, I mean, we're not going to have, I don't want to have a, a Christian nation that way. Yep. I do want Christianity um, and and the way I understand my faith to participate in the building of a society where all voices um, really have an equal voice at the table, and where even within faith, I mean, one of the things we're you know we're really wrestling with is who speaks for Christianity. I mean, on every issue around women, around uh, gays, around economic justice. I mean, all of it is really like a we're having our a, a very deep internal conversation where we really almost feel like, you know, I don't I don't even know how we re if we're cousins, we're very distant co cousins. Um, so so I, I I'm I'm not despairing. I'm actually feeling like there, you know, one of the one of the important things again in recognizing going into the 2020 election is that um, it's kind of right wing white Christians and everybody else. Yeah. You know, I mean, really yeah. everybody else. Yeah. So I'm including Catholics in that and I'm including like really like, you know, 
hardcore nationalist right wing uh, evangelicals. Um, but the kind of like, you know, if you look at, you know, the rest of Christian denominations, the rest of um, the Jewish population, Muslims, um, non-affiliated but interested uh there it's really kind of everyone else is on is 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 looking for a a, 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 an america where everyone can practice their religion no matter what kind of christianity you want to practice no no practice their religion no matter what kind of islam but whose actions allow for space for everyone to be different so so that's really important my own faith has been really right now is really interesting it it has gone in a lot of different um iterations um having kids has been an experience that has uh influence the way I approach religion. Um, my partner, Brad Gooch, who's a writer, um, has um, been a practice, practicing Episcopalian for a long time. Um, and so we've started, you know, we, I, I have joined him even before we had kids at, at um, a church um, that we, we go to in the village. Um, and then, you know, when we were going to get married, um, the priest there, who was someone who I went to Union Seminary with, um, Mary Falk, she was a priest there at the time. You know, we went through marriage counseling, you know, I mean, and we, we did the whole thing and we kind of eloped. We didn't have any of our family there, but we got married in the church. Um, and then we, when we had kids, um, we, they were baptized in the church. Um, and, um, and we go to church almost every Sunday. Um, and I have to say, like, we have a, you know, we have a very pious little four-year-old because, like, Walter and I, I mean, rather, uh, Brad and I are kind of like, you know, oh, should we go to church? It's, you know, it's kind of nice out or it's raining. And Walter, Walter loves it because, yeah. it because we show up there as a family hmm. and because we're not doing the kind of other things that we do. Hmm. And in some ways, I actually feel like that's a selling point for the church is that you're doing a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He hears sacred music at church. Um, He doesn't hear sacred music the rest of the week. He hears live voices. Um, He sees he sees ritual for him. It's pageantry, but he sees ritual. He sees people who who he doesn't really know why we're there. Yeah. Um, he, we, we get communion. It's all these things that, um, for him are just us doing these things together. Yeah. And it has a sense about it. That's beautiful. Mm. That's fun. It was, it was interesting when he was two, he was kind of a holy roller and, and he learned the word hallelujah. And so he would shout it out at all different times, not realizing that that was something that Episcopalians say like three times at a very appropriate times. And he would be like in the middle of the thing, all of a sudden, hallelujah. And we were just like, okay, sorry. We are like, he's filled with the spirit. Um, but, uh, but, but anyway, and, and, you know, and so we, um, that's, that's really important to us. And, um, it feels very traditional. Um, and, and that feels good. Yeah. Um, I, I want him to have a sense of history. Um, by that, I mean, I want him to feel connected to something that is not based on commodification, although religion can be commodified, but capitalism, really almost everything you touch is, I mean, everything has a purpose. It's trying to get you to do something. Yeah. And in some ways, this is a, a little bit of a, um, a, a vacation from capitalism yeah. um, and and a vacation from a very intense world, uh, even as a four year old that is telling you how to live up to a standard that um, has already been set for what a good four year old should be. Um, and that really isn't happening um, so much, although, you know, there's judgment everywhere, but, but it really isn't like this explicit thing, you know, we, the, you know, what are your test scores? You know I mean? Like, you know, so I, I, I do think that the, I think the church um, should be a place where you reflect on the world, um, where you feel, you know, uh, inspired and also where you feel like you can breathe an air that is not trying to compel you um, to participate 
in the the system that is pitting us against each other. Um, so, so we that is that is um, our our and and um, I say prayers with Walter every night. Mm-hmm. And basically, he doesn't know what a prayer is exactly. But I said, let's send let's send love and good thoughts to. But we call them prayers. Yeah. Uh, and so we go through his friends, and then sometimes you know, and and he he prays for he has a little brother now. Um, and you know, and that's not always easy, but he, he st- always starts with, with his little brother, uh, Glenn. And, um, and then he, pr- you know, he'll pray for, um, the dinosaurs. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so they, yeah, they do need it. They, you know, he doesn't quite realize the destruction is about to rain down on them. But, um, but anyway, he, you know, he, I'm not saying that I have like this saintly little kid. I'm just saying that, you know, we're trying to create in him a, a, a way of um, being in the world that offers some mystery, yeah. um, which of course young kids like, yeah. um, and and then off, that offers him spaces that are different than the other spaces. That, and so I so that feels like good religion to me, and without like making him memorize certain things, like he you know we have not asked him to learn the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Um, all of that will come, yeah. um, but I would rather him hear it a lot of times and then begin to be curious about it yeah. uh, and then be able to respond. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And religion is kind of stripped down to that sacred ritualized form that helps ground people throughout their lives. It seems to me to make a lot more sense and be a lot more compelling than the system of doctrines and dogmas and creeds. Um, it's just so beautifully articulated. So thank mm-hmm. you. And with that, I do want to say thank you. Thank you for your sharing this journey with us today on the podcast, but also just the work that you do in the world. It's been, like I said earlier, so amazing to watch. And I'm grateful for the way that you've helped lift up progressive voices and be a profound progressive voice yourself. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And is there a place we can find you on the internet? Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm really active on Twitter um, these days more than anything. It's just Rauschenbusch, uh, R-A-U-S-H-E-N-B-U-S-H. I try to be loving. I, I really do. Yeah. It's not always, I, you know, I, I, I'm not always as loving as I need to be, yeah. but I, I, I try. Last question. Do you follow Donald Trump on Twitter? I do. Okay. I do. God bless you. I, I do. And I, you know, because I'm curious what he's saying. And I do want to say one more thing. Uh, you, I mean, you'll edit this out. But um, I think we have to try. And there's some people who are really good at dialogue with people who are really different than them. I'm not so good at it. And, I, and I've decided that I'm actually not interested in dialogue around um, whether or not LGBTQI people should be <laughs> in the church or treated with dignity or given full rights. Like, I, I kind of like that's like, I'm not interested in that debate. But I, um, but I, am, I am trying to keep an open mind and heart and spirit to hearing stories of what is... Um, uh, in what is compelling people into a different worldview than my own and figuring out ways that we can have a conversation that they can be more human, I can be more human, and ultimately they will leave Donald Trump behind. <laughs> I have to say I'm, not in, I'm, not, I'm, in it, I'm in it for a purpose, and as would they be. So, um, but I, I do think like you, you can only um, – you, you, hitting people – doesn't always work um and so it it, it doesn't really work so (laughs) so so i do think like the spiritual discipline um that some people have more than others to be uh in community with people who are very different than us um is what is a it's a it's a it's a muscle that needs to be flexed as as much as people can right now yeah and that might just heal the world seeing that sign behind you (laughs) (laughs) god willing I hope you found today's content compelling and inspiring. It's through listening in and learning from others who see the world differently than we do, which by the way means everyone because no two people share the same vantage point. That's how we grow and expand. If you did enjoy today's podcast, please share it with your friends on social media and help spread the word. And when you do, use the hashtag patchwork. 
If you'd like to support this podcast financially, head on over to patreon.com and search for Brandon Robertson. There you can become a monthly subscriber to this podcast. No gift is too big or too small. And you'll get tons of bonus materials that we produce just for our Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much in advance. Thank you again for spending some time with us today. Until next time, peace be with you.